Happy Friday. We've almost made it through the entire week. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thanks for listening to the Bulwark podcast. And uh, a quick reminder for those of you who have not yet signed up for Bulwark Plus, if you do, you'll have access to things like our Thursday night live stream, which was uh, a little bit lit last night, uh, <laughs> as, as well as um, other podcasts, including the Next Level podcast, the Secret podcast. Uh, of course, Mona Chern has an absolutely outstanding podcast, uh, uh, Beg to Differ. And you can get to read all of these stylings of, of our colleague Tim Miller as well. And Tim joins me on uh, what's a beautiful Friday here in the Midwest. So uh, thanks for coming on, Tim. Hey, Charlie, every day is beautiful here in the East Bay, but I'm glad that you're getting to also enjoy the spoils. Um, we, you know, we have about six weeks of good weather here in Wisconsin <laughs> and, 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 and we, and we cling to it. Okay. So we got to have something to get us in the mood today. All right. So I, 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 I was, I was thinking, how do we, how do we set the mood? Um, let, let's do a little bit of the, of the North Korean stylings of Chanel Rion. Is that how it's pronounced? Rion? Rion? Is that her name? Jim Swift name? is the expert on this producer, Jim Swift. I, I don't know. I actually don't Jim, know. Okay. Jim, can you, can you, can you jump in? Is it Chanel Rion? Is that? It's Chanel Rion, one okay. of America's foremost political cartoonists who pillories the libs. Okay. She is like a, a conspiracy theorist who has, has a show on OAN. I mean, OAN, you know, One America Network Now, whatever, is, is, I mean, it's batshit crazy. It's, you know, but she's like the, she's like the maven of guano level crazy, right? I mean, Chanel, which is like too perfect, Chanel. Well, it really she, should it, be. It's really like a, either fake name or a dog's name. But. Well, that's what I'm coming. Is it real? Charlie, she went to Harvard Extension. No, no, she did. She went to a Harvard extension, you know, the, the online Harvard degree that you pay out. Okay. The for. Right. okay. So, okay. So I, Charles J. Sykes, am calling for a complete ban on everyone from Harvard in American politics until we find out what's going on. <laughs> what is this thing? So anyway, speaking of North Korean dear leader vibe, um, he, he, she actually had an exclusive interview with the former guy and it's yeah you have to listen to just the the introduction of it and and i just want you to think that there are broadcasters in north korea who are thinking have to up our game have to up our game chanel rion on oan last night president donald j trump left an indelible mark on u.s politics from the 25th floor of his iconic new york headquarters one America News sat down with our 45th president for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one discussion. There, he shared with us his forecast, his fears, and his hopes for America's horizon. In the process, we witness an illuminating snapshot into the mind of a man whose leadership in battles sparked a movement that forever altered the course of American history. This is an OAN exclusive interview from New York City, New York. Mr. President, we sit here in Trump Tower many days and many miles from what many Americans consider an illegitimate Biden White House. <laughs> okay. Jesus Christ, girl. Yeah, all right. I mean, where do, you, where do you go with this, you know? So this is how it's going. Um, now, as crazy as that is, okay, no, it, that, that, that's crazy. Just, like, can we just put a line under it because it is um, – his wait, hopes, wait. his fears, his dreams. The man who has transformed, and of course, that illegitimate White House. And of course, this is the, the problem is that this is catching on with, 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 with folks. And you're seeing this. You, you sent me a, a, a Slack last night about um, all the Republican senators who are backing off now of the January 6th commission. I mean, these are people who explicitly, word for word, like five minutes ago, said, yes, absolutely, we need a bipartisan commission. Yes, absolutely, it should focus just on January 6th. And one after another, they're going, hey, you know, no, not doing it. Mike, Mike Rounds, John Cornyn, of course, Fluffer's going to fluff, you know, Lindsey Graham doing it. So I mean, and and they're they're just running away from it as uh, as fast as they can, sort of sort of like what Kevin McCarthy did when he ran away from that press conference yesterday. I mean, it is one of those things where it every when you feel like last year during twenty twenty that like we have reached the lowest of the low, 
right? When you, when you feel like you just can't dig any lower into the Earth's crust, <laughs> yeah. like these guys managed to find like another layer below the mesosphere. I, it's just how can Mike Rounds live with himself? I, it was it was two days ago. I, it was two days ago that he said you know, that he called what happened an insurrection. And said that we need to get to the bottom of it and figure out what happened. And then two days after that, yeah, you know, he gets slapped down by somebody. I don't know if, if you know, he got a call from uh, a fax from from South Florida or, you know, whether uh, it was, you know, Mitch is whipping or what's happening. But but two days later, he completely switches and says that he, he doesn't want this to be an election year issue. <laughs> he never He like, never said it. It's the Republican – you wrote about this, though. It's the Republican neuralizer, right? Just yeah. remind people what the, what the neuralizer is. Uh, in Men in Black, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you had Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. They put that little thing up between your uh, in front of your eyes, and they pressed it uh, so that you didn't remember that you knew that there were aliens there. Another topic on Bork's live stream last night. Um, but uh, – yeah, Totally you know, memory erasure. Yeah, it, but this it, it is didn't not happen. like us playing games with words. I mean, these guys were all explicitly clear. John Cornyn went so far as to say explicitly that he agrees with Nancy <laughs> Pelosi that we need a bipartisan commission. Um, uh, you know, uh, everyone uh, uh, across the board. And now, you know, they are all so scared of their own shadow that they can't even uh, answer the question. Haley Bird over the dispatch was asking them about it. And, you know, it's like, uh, oh, uh, Rob Portman isn't sure yet, and Marco hasn't read it, and, you know, Lindsay hasn't decided yet. It's, I, I mean, it's like this has been going on for four months. How can you not decide? How can you not know what's in it? Uh, how can you not know that we need to have a bipartisan commission? I, the rules, by the way, are not biased towards the Democrats. It's the same thing as the 9-11 commission. Uh, it's it's Republican. There are five Republican appointees. And, um, you know, in order to get a subpoena, one of them needs to be on board. So, I, you know, it's just I, I'm just grateful that our, our colleague Amanda Carpenter has just been like a dog on a bone on this, uh, because, you know, sometimes you feel like you just can't get the old blood pressure up every day about the new, newest thing. But, um, you know, she's really been on this for, for, for a while now. And like over the last 24 hours, I've kind of finally hit my limit. It's just I, I really just on the Next Level podcast on Wednesday – shows you what I get for having just even a, a tinge of optimism. I, you know, my take was that I, I just don't see how they don't get to 10, right? It's just how yeah. can you not, you know, given what Mitch McConnell said about how dark of a day this was for our democracy, given that even at that point, even Mike Rounds of South Dakota was on the record saying he's for it. I, I just don't see how you get to 10. And now it's clear that they are trying to circle the wagons to prevent uh, to, to prevent 10 um uh, votes from from getting there and it's just like you know i you you can you got to be speechless about this okay so I, I was debating whether i was gonna say this so um i'm out walking my dogs because i spent a yeah. lot of time doing that L- listening to um you know msnbc on on sirius x and radio and you're on and, and you're on with nicole wallace and so i'm i'm, I'm walking along there and you're how commenting on um, huh how good was i you are very good, but the, my point was that I heard something in your voice, like just what you just said there. It was like, okay, so I'm not the only one who sort of wants to scream. <laughs> it was like because I've known you for a long time, and you're usually you know sort of like, and it was that that was just a little bit, and it was, are you out of your fucking mind? Sort of tone, like do you realize what's happening here, and we have been doing this for so long. You'd think it would be like. Same old, same old, numb. Didn't we tell you? Ah, come on, you know that. But no, I. So, I was kind of there. It, 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 it really did strike me that you were in that mode there. So I, I, I yeah. heard it. I heard, I, I heard I, that. And you tie it to this Chanel, the Chanel Rion thing. We're laughing, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. But I, it, this is one of those things where it's like. If you fly back in, uh, I'm I'm doing all my '80s and '90s movies references today. But you know, if you get if you get in uh, your Back to the Future car, and you know, you go back to 2016, and you say to our, you say to us like, Trump is going to win. Uh, uh, then in tw- then for real, like he's going to lose. He's going to claim that it was that it was wrongful the loss. His fans are going to storm the Capitol. Five people are going to die from it, a- and then and then a half year after that, uh, there's going to be an entire media ecosystem that that pretends that he's the president in exile. 
uh, you know, and, and, and that all of the Republican senators are going to say, no big deal. Let's move on. I, I mean, I, I, you would just you would you would slap the person. <laughs> this, is, this is not possible. I mean, as bad as I thought it was going to be, and I thought it was going to be really fucking bad, Charlie. Like, I, I, it, and it's just amazing. And this kind of also goes to your newsletter item this morning. Like how many normal seeming people are just like, well, you know. Yeah, you read that. Just a little light insurrection at the Capitol. And then, you know, half the country pretending like a game show host is the president in exile. No big deal. Yeah, if if you're a subscriber to Bulwark Plus, you got my my newsletter morning shots. And I included a couple of emails from people, uh, listeners, who are just describing conversations they have with normal people. And it's it's concerning. (laughs) Let's just say it it will not necessarily make your day. So all of it, and what what it it reflects is the fact that you have, you know, tens of millions of people who are believing this stuff right now. This is this is not as isolated as you and I would like to think that it is, which is why last night during the live stream, I suggested that not not only am I starting to believe that, you know, UFOs are real, but that (laughs) if in fact we are being visited by alien life forms, perhaps we will greet them as liberators. (laughs) <laughs> maybe there'll be a different version of independence day where they come and go thank god you're here i, I gotta i gotta take the other side of that it's just like i it, i keep getting surprised by how bad things could be i mean maybe the aliens are even worse than imaginable <laughs> i don't know so um before we get into some of the other stuff uh you had a great um not your party uh if, if people haven't watched this these things are getting better and better by the way tim you're, you're not your party thing that you're doing for snapchat and you talk about the mask wars. And I just wanted to start, you know, this whole thing um, where the mask is no longer about protecting you from getting sick. It's the cultural signal that you're either not a Republican or you're not a Democrat. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because we should be ready for hot Joe summer, right? And instead, people seem to want to keep fighting about this stuff. I can't, and I, I, I will rant about this for you, but I yeah, do just want to say, and a good news about not, about not my party um, uh, is that, uh, so to celebrate, you know, in certain parts of the country, obviously, uh, the, the rules are different than in other places, and I was I was home visiting my parents, bringing, letting them see the grandkid, and, and the night I was there last weekend, the bars opened, and so we went, um, you know, went out to the gay bar, haven't been to one of those in 18 months, just a little celebration, and uh, my husband and I, and... Um, uh, there was, uh, you know, they. Re- I was recognized from not my party on Snapchat, not from MSNBC, but from not my party by like a twenty something. I'm thinking, okay, we're very, this is very different, de- very it's, different demographic, very different demo. It's happening on Snapchat. People are watching this. <laughs> so if you have nieces or nephews or whatever, tell them to to download it and check it out on, and to subscribe to not my party it was much more pleasant no offense love being recognized in whole foods by the boomers love it so just come (laughs) say hi if you see me in a whole foods that's totally fine but it was it was a refreshing difference um as far as this is the subject matter at hand um it's pretty frustrating particularly here in the bay area and I, i understand in the grand scheme of things um you know, and I don't, I didn't, I, I went out of my way to not draw false equivalents, right? I mean, the, the people who are still fighting these pandemic culture wars, like Candace Owens and and everyone at the Daily Wire, basically, who's saying like, don't, you know, don't, you don't have to get a vaccine; it's individual choice, and and you don't wear masks in any circumstances, and obviously all the nonsense Trump was doing last year. That put people's lives at risk and and didn't just put people's lives at risk, really. People died because of it, frankly. People died because of, you know, Trump's COVID tour. And I did plenty of ranting about that. We all did. Uh, and, and obviously that is a category difference. That, that said, I just the bipartisan, you know, the partisans digging in their heels on both sides and wanting these w- wars to go on forever. The COVID culture wars, like everybody just needs to stop. Right. It, it's it's coming to an end. In some places it is over right here where I live in san francisco the virus itself is is over uh in san francisco san francisco general hospital as of yesterday i just saw this in this morning's chronicle has zero covid patients for the first time uh since uh you know march of 2020 or whatever february 2020 that is fantastic news right like everybody should be celebrating our victory (laughs) we're coming into summertime right now Uh, uh there is no need there is no need for you know these sort of you know, government mandated restrictions on actions in San Francisco. 
right now when there's when there's no when there's no coronavirus there there's just no there's no need for it there's certainly no need for another thing that the chronicle reported which is people who who have taken off their mask getting shouted down on the street and and being called murderers and being flipped off i I mean that is not following the science that's being an asshole that's insane and irrational and and if you everybody if you still want to wear your mask because you've come to like it or because you don't want to get the flu or a cold or whatever you don't like the summer sniffle great like good for everybody can do what they want right um this is this is a a free country great country um but the continued restrictions in places where we've beaten the, beaten the virus, the judging and the fighting with people who, who are ready to move on and celebrate our victory um, uh, uh, just needs to stop. And, and, and I think that I've, I've said this a couple of times, but I, I really think in particular as a political matter, the Democrats should be taking the win here. I mean, just think about you know, what was marshaled is the pharma companies, the Biden administration, all these vi- volunteers getting the shots in the arms. Uh, this should be a time of celebration, not a time of saying, no, we need to do this forever. So that that's my rant um, uh, that, that I did this week. Now, I'm hoping, trying to be the optimist, I, I'm, I'm hoping that most people are, in fact, taking the celebration that – that what you're seeing is is another one of these versions of you know Twitter not being real life. But sure. but on the other hand, we do live in a political culture where people are quite literally sitting around looking for some excuse to be an asshole sitting around looking for something to be outraged about it. I mean, this is the whole Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens world. You know, what can we be outraged about? Um, hey, here's a quick seg- segue. Uh, speaking of of like signaling, Ted Cruz, <clears throat> our buddy Ted Cruz. <laughs> Ted Cruz, who's the, the manliest man in the world, right? I mean, Ted Ted Cruz, I mean, this guy is six-pack Ted. He's kind of known, you know, by his, by his colleagues. <laughs> so he tweets keg. out- I think it's a keg. He he tweets out a basically this this video this Russian propaganda video the Russian arm that is sort of notorious anti semite named whatever her name is it, you know Russian army ad versus U S army ad and so it's you know it's it's Putin propaganda and Ted Cruz tweets out holy crap perhaps a woke emasculated military is not the best idea now I don't know if I don't want to you know, engage in cheap shots here but if I'm Ted Cruz. I do not want to be using the word emasculated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, somebody on social media does. So, you know, you got to take the good with the bad. With uh, Everybody's <laughs> looking to be a jerk on social media because somebody really nailed it with the... Uh, you remember Ted Cruz's slogan in 2016? It was like... Oh, I forget what it was, but it ended with T E D and so it was Ted in all caps. Yeah. So, it's, so it's kind of a, a double yeah. a double negative for Ted that both he has been emasculated and it ends in his name. So it's like emasculate Ted. Emas- um I got a nice I got a nice chuckle out of that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't the these guys um have reverted again. This happened during the Obama administration too, a lot, you remember. And and it was something that would grind my gears even back then. You know, this sort of notion that like Putin was so strong and Obama was so weak. Right. And, right, right. and, you know, it's like, you know, Dinesh, yeah, Dinesh D'Souza used to go on this, on this rant a lot, you know, another just sort of you know, really, you know, when you think about somebody who, who, who just shares masculine virtues and strength and toughness, you think about a feat Dinesh D'Souza. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he would say that, that, you know, Putin was so strong. And I was always like, well, actually, if Obama was as strong as Putin, Dinesh D'Souza would be dead. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so like, we should we should have a little appreciation for, you know, the the way that, you know, America shows its strength, which is which is not necessarily in this in this toxic, you know, Russian manner. But, but look, these guys, they don't they don't they don't they don't care about it. Now, like all this other stuff, you know, all, all of the, the sort of broadly defined uniting American values like are no longer operative for these folks, right? I mean, they see people like Ted, um, who has been emasculated over and over again by Donald Trump, um, literally cucked uh, by Donald Trump and the discussion of his wife. Uh, like he, he has picked this team and, he said, and he's on Donald Trump's team now and, and the enemy <laughs> is domestic, Right. And so it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's a Russian propaganda video or a Chinese propaganda video or anything else. The the real enemy for Ted Cruz is the liberals. And that's that's a dangerous place to be.
Well, also, the the sort of implicit mocking of the U.S. military just strikes me as profoundly stupid. I mean, you know, you're a comms guy. You're sitting in Ted Cruz's office. Hey, I want to refer to the U.S. military as being emasculated and as pansies. This is the latest thing, pansies. He said, he said uh, I'm enjoying lefty blue check marks losing their minds over the tweet. You know, saying that I'm attacking the military. Actually, what I'm trying to do is Democrats and woke media trying to turn them into pansies. First of all, when's the last time you heard the word pansy? Pansies. <laughs> you know, I always think of, yes, that's my concern, that the Marines will become pansies, that the Air Force will become, our fighter jets will be flown by pansies. I mean, I, these guys have become these cartoon versions of themselves. Putting on the fatigues <laughs> to go to the border. You yeah. know, I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. I mean, like Ted Cruz just sit, like puts his beer on his belly and watches MMA on TV. I mean, like this guy does like if you looked at his cuticles, I mean, this guy has never uh, you know gotten in a, in a fight in his life. Not that you would want to. Not that there's anything special about that. But I mean, he's never done a hard day's labor. And he is just, you know, what uh, I it is, it's all just phony performative nonsense. And, and yeah. the other thing is, don't we shouldn't we trust our military with these sorts of videos that there's some st strategy here that these guys know what they're doing. And the same thing happened in that CIA video, remember, that was talking about kind of, uh, you know, intersectionality and <laughs> multiculturalism and, and all this. And, and everybody was attacking that video. And I was like, I, actually, is it possible that the CIA is is being smart here? Like, think about the kind of work that they have to do, right? That they want to attract a, you know, college-educated, diverse, you know, uh, a smart workforce that can, you know, infiltrate multiple different cultures. And, and, and you know, I mean, just think about the type of work the CIA has to do. Like, they don't just need, you know, white bros from Alabama. Nothing wrong with white bros from Alabama, but I think that they are interested in, in going yes. into the military, right? So you got to recruit a diverse, a diverse workforce to match the challenges of the time, right? But but uh, that's you know these guys don't actually yeah. give a shit about the facts about any of that, right? Like they're just looking for an excuse to you know, jump you on know, the lips. You know what I would really pay money for? I mean, I'd actually pay significant money for. This would be a great fundraiser for the U.S. military, for example, um, and an arm wrestle between Tammy Duckworth and Ted Cruz. <laughs> I mean, come on. Can we make this happen? Tam Tammy <laughs> Duckworth, in. who's actually a veteran, she says, so, you know, Cruz tweets out, holy crap, perhaps a woke emasculated military is not the best idea. And Tammy Duckworth, um, she subtweets him, holy crap, perhaps a U.S. senator sh should not suggest the Russian military is better than the U.S. military that protected him from an insurrection he helped foment. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I, I go back at it. Speaking of, by Tammy the way, was my pick for DP for, for VP from the start, you know, so I, I, I've had a soft spot. speaking of people who are embracing side of you know, embracing the butch fascist adjacent, I'm more manly than you are thing. Um, and also this whole problem we have of, of the Ivy league. And I, I mean, apparently Harvard and Yale are just not sending their best people. I don't know what the hell. So you know, JD Vance, who, had this brief moment as this best-selling author, you know, big thinker, you know, writes Hillbilly Elegy and, and had some interesting contributions. And he has just gone full out into Magalan. And he apparently he's running for United States Senate and feels that he needs to pander to the lowest common denominator. So on a regular basis, he's uh, he's licking um, uh, Tucker Carlson's <clears throat> toes and um, a variety of other things. And did you hear this speech he gave, you know, where – He's talking about, you know, how we need to crush certain people. Uh, Jim, do you, do you have the J.D. Vance uh, soundbite? I just I want, I want to play that and then get some thoughts about that. If you are fighting the American nation state, if you are fighting the values and virtues that make this country great, the conservative movement should be about nothing if not reducing your power and, if necessary, destroying you. We cannot huh? let the people who are driving this country into the ground, continue to benefit from special privileges, from tax breaks, from subsidies, and from liability protections. That is the simple rule that we should follow. $120 billion of Harvard University endowment is ammunition for our enemies. And we can't let the enemy have that much ammunition or we're going to lose. It's that simple. This principle should guide all of our policy response. If you cannot go after the pocketbook of these people, if you cannot make them pay, then you are accepting defeat. It's that simple. 
We're never going to beat them unless we go after them. It's 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 that simple. It's that simple. If if, if we what politically disagree about? with us, we should use the power of the state to crush you and to destroy you. It's just that simple. Is that other people have different value systems than we are, and if I get into power, um, what we're going to do is we are going to destroy them and we are going to loot their money. Now, I don't know. I, I guess I'm older than you, as you've pointed out many times, Tim. <laughs> um, although still spry, but I kind of remember when conservatives would particularly not embrace the idea of government and coming and looting people's money, period, for whatever reason, um, but certainly not looting people's money because you want to destroy them as political opponents. I mean, what the fuck? I got to, I do have to just, you know, give myself one credit here because my <laughs> predictions are usually so bad, but I had sniffed them out. I don't know what it was about Hillbilly Elegy when everybody was praising it, but his whole mien on that book tour, I was like, I don't know about this guy. I was like, I, I don't know what it is. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I just, I wasn't buying what he was selling. And, um, uh, that was obviously the right instinct because that rant there is is again is is about as un-American as it can get, right? And, and it goes exactly back to this Ted Cruz thing: the the Harvard endowment like, is our enemy, like that. That's the the enemy of who? Like the enemy of what? Right? I mean, it it, it produced assholes like JD Vance, so I, I guess that that's a problem. But uh, you know, I this assault on. You know the elites or the the the, the smart, you know, like I, I don't, you know, it, it is it, there is nothing underneath it, right? And there is no there is no specific policy proposal. There is no you know kind of value. There is no principle. It is just pure negative partisanship and grievance. And it, and it's you guys are mad at the smarty smarts and the rich and the and the people with money and the people on the coasts, and we've got to stick it to them. And we had to yeah. use our power to stick it to them. I mean, it's a deeply un-American philosophy and a dangerous philosophy. And and, and the thing that worries me, Charlie, is that it's it might be the most in touch. We'll see in the Republican primary out there if he gets in. But it might oh, be no, the most no. in touch philosophy is what the Republican base wants. That's the scariest part. Well, OK, now now this is where I'm I'm a little bit confused because – what he's describing is a strategy where we identify our opponents, people who have different values than we are, and we destroy them. We reduce their power. Well, that's part of it, you know, de that, you know, dem democracy, whatever. But, but he means to destroy them, take their money, et cetera. What, what exactly do conservatives mean when they describe cancel culture? Because I, okay, here, here let me just switch a little bit. So yeah. there's this, this young woman uh, who's a reporter for the Associated Press. Her name is Emily Wilder. Okay. Um, she, when she was a student at Stanford University, she was um, kind of an anti-Israel, anti-Israel uh, activist. She may be, she may actually be Jewish, but she was kind of pro-Palestinian. In any case, she wrote and said things that, um, you know, uh, obnoxious college students might write. But conservative outlets, including the Federalists, the Free Beacon, and and others, the, the college Republicans, uh, you know, waged this campaign to out her. Um, and yesterday, the Associated Press um, announced that she had basically been fired. A note to say that news associate Emily Wilder is no longer with the AP. So after conservatives rallied to get her fired because she was part of Students for Justice in Palestine back when she was in, in, in college. So, OK, I, I, I'm confused because how is this not the same cancel culture that conservatives say they hate? Right. So. You know, yeah. when, when Marco Rubio says the biggest problem facing America and why we can't beat China is because of our cancel culture. OK, well, what what do you what is your definition of cancel culture? Well, and it, it's one of these things where it's like, well, the liberals did one bad thing, you know, and so and so now we've got to do the exact same thing. You know, we've got to use all of these tactics that we decry. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, I wrote something before the election about how about how Marco and, and people like that are what they said they hated. Like they, like they became everything that they, that they decried during my entire youth, my entire childhood growing up or through the Obama administration. They've embraced all of that in, in the name of this sort of imaginary kind of civil war that exists only in people's heads and online. Um, so, I, you know, I didn't follow this, uh, this exact situation mm -hmm. that closely, about as closely as you. It seems outrageous. And like the idea that anyone 
in an entry level job of any type could lose it based on what they wrote when they were in college. I mean, I was I was just a complete dumbass in college. So I, I just I, I refuse to accept that. Um, she should be judged on her work at the AP, which it, it, based on what I read, there was no criticism about any of her work. Uh, the AP should be ashamed of themselves and cowering uh, um, for cowering in the face of the Stanford College Republic. Oh, the Stanford College Republicans are going to attack us on Twitter. It's like, who cares? Who cares? Everybody needs to take a breath. All this stuff moves on after a day or two yeah, no, unless no it's one, a serious yeah. thing that's merited i mean people should right. lose their work if they made a mistake on the job right um but but this is not that so i, I do just want to say really quick since you brought this up um uh because i've been i've been meaning to it is uh, uh the there's kind of this related you know issue you know about the the rise in the anti-semitic you know, violence really in, in America as a result, as a result of, on this. And so, you know, again, not doing any sort of false equivalence, but just thinking about how heated this, this debate is right now, like the idea that there are Jews in New York right now on the street in the diamond district or whatever, who are afraid that they're going to get shout down. They're going to get bottles thrown at them. <laughs> yeah. Right. That, 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 again, that this woman could get, I mean, everybody like this is, this is part of a very, again, un-American balkanized, culture right that that we're that we are attacking each other and attacking our uh, uh, for over political opinions and 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 it just has to stop like we, we have to well, stop it uh, yeah you're right but i don't think we are stopping it because i think that there are so many people who have a vested interest in stoking the outrage yep. the division you know the, the fear it's etc et which is why i am we, we don't have time to get into it but i, I am increasingly concerned about um, you know, or the future of political violence. Uh, Michael Gerson has a great piece in the Washington Post. I would strongly urge people to read about the way that, you know, the, the threat of violence is really becoming a central to our politics. Uh, Peter Weiner has a very, very strong piece in the Atlantic on it. Um, I think this thing, people need to be concerned about all of this. Okay, so let's switch gears because I, I want to get your take on a couple of different things. Okay. Chris Cuomo. Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo. Okay, so everybody knew that it was a conflict of interest um, during the coronavirus thing when everybody decided that Andrew Cuomo was uh, was Mr. Cool and everything, and there were the Cuomo sexuals out there, and he would go on his brother's show on CNN, and they kind of had a love fest. I think people kind of thought that maybe that was a little bit uh, a little bit awkward. Now we find out that Chris Cuomo. Everybody knows this story by now, but you know we now find out that Chris Cuomo was on the part of these conference calls with with aides who were strategizing um, how Andrew Cuomo should deal with all these sexual harassment allegations. And apparently Chris Cuomo was telling him to not resign, to double down, to push back, to claim that he was a victim of cancel culture. And everybody's sort of going, OK, that was inappropriate. Uh, Chris Cuomo was apologized. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, that was another thing that smelled bad while it was happening. You yeah. know, those sort of chummy interviews. And, and you know, the other piece of information that's come out recently is that Cuomo got $5 million for the book deal. I, I, I just, just I, it's a little crap. frustrating that Andrew Cuomo has survived, uh, to be honest. Um, and, and I think that, that he probably deserves another round of, of media pressure uh, to resign. Uh, obviously, Chris being on this call, totally inappropriate. And it's just, you know, one of the CNN reporters did a tweet that's like, well, I mean, let me explain this to you. Chris just signed a multi-year deal. and <laughs> What's CNN supposed to do? And it's just like, compare the CNN story to that AP story we just talked about, right? Um, you know, companies um, can make decisions when someone actually makes a mistake on the job. I'm not calling for Chris Cuomo's head or whatever, but I, I think if CNN is looking for to gain credibility uh, in a post-Trump era, uh, it feels like they need to do something. Um, I, I did all enjoy our friend Ala Pundit's tweet about this, though, because Fox was, you know, going round the clock on this. Um, uh, obviously, this is this is bread and butter for Fox. <laughs> Ala was like, I mean, wasn't every Fox primetime host a consultant to the president well, exactly. of the United States See, that, that, that's... for the last four years? So uh, that's a good point. I, we, we can't lose sight of that. The, the, what Chris Cuomo did was it was totally inappropriate. It was his brother, uh, you know, uh, inappropriate. You get it. But but you know, it, it's hard to take seriously these kind of conservative media critics attacks when when there's silence over the fact that Hannity and Tucker and and Ducey and all these guys were informal informal aides to the president basically for four years. 
Yeah, but see, that, that's part of this this downward spiral of whataboutism because, that's yeah, true. I mean, Fo- Fox News has basically blown up any sort of journalistic credibility with with that kind of relationship. You know, Hannity showing up, you know, on the stage at rallies and stuff like that. Yeah. We, n- no secret whatsoever. Yeah, Laura did you know, too, actually. All of these that. guys are on the phone. And who is who is the old nut job that got uh, the, the, the guy canned? You know, Dobbs. Lou, Lou Dobbs was you know, on conference calls with, with, with Trump from the Oval Office and all of that stuff. So, yeah, how can you hold anybody to any standard? But I guess that's the question is, um, do you allow them to drag everybody down or do you still draw a line? I, the the only mitigating circumstance here is, is that it was his his brother. I mean, you know, f- families, you know, OK, so your brother's in if a lot of trouble. If he didn't have him on, I would, I would be with you he on should that. Never, how what they were thinking having him on. I mean, that was. Um, that was, that was a bad call. So back the book, I, I, I ran it and raved about this the other day, the $5 million. Yeah. I still cannot understand what the publisher was thinking. That was not a business decision. There was no way they were going to earn that kind of money. So it turns out that the book sold around roughly 50,000 copies, which is pretty good. I mean, if you or I sold 50,000, we'd be, Hey, that's fantastic. That's great. But we're not going to get a $5 million advance. That's like $111. I mean, it's like a hundred bucks a book. Um, and I mean, the way it works is, you know, whatever the the price of the book, let's say the book's 28 bucks or whatever. I'm making this up here. Sure. But the author gets 15% or something like that or some percentage of it. So um, there's really no way. Just do the math on this. <laughs> I mean, I mean this it's not even in the ballpark. This is crazy shit, you know? So I, I don't I don't know. Um, so Joe Biden. Uh, gave an interview, his first print interview as as president, and a couple of interesting takeaways, including the fact that, you know, despite all of the commentary about how far left this administration is going, uh, one of my takeaways was that he was willing to say, I'm, I'm not going to be canceling that student uh, loan debt. I'm not doing that. Your thoughts? It was such a good Joe Biden line, I thought, on, on this. I just want to pull up exactly what he said. So it was, it was, it was just right in his brand. Um, and, and, what, and what I think a lot of us were hoping for, for from Joe Biden. Here, here it is. He says, the idea that you go to Penn and you're paying a total of 70000 bucks a year and the public should pay for that, I don't agree. And so, you know, I, I think this was not him – you know, saying, oh, no, no, none of the progressive ideas about about making college more affordable are, are smart. You know, and I think they've already proposed the community college plan. Um, I'm sure, you could get them on board with some sort of compromise. He's dealing Joe after all. But but this notion of a, of a seventy thousand dollar, you know, of, of people going to elite colleges and making that choice and then getting it written off, you know, ex post facto is is not in line with with the Scranton Joe Biden ethos at all right and and, and I and I, I've been I was worried about that when this proposal was going through right because it, it, it also seemed just as a political matter whatever you think about the merits and I'm opposed to it on the merits but what, but as a political matter if if one of the big swing constituencies is for, here as for Democrats how do you sort of win back some of these you know more, um, uh, working class, you know, white voters who who are, have been culturally attracted to Trump, but but you know, you're not ever going to get back to fifty percent. But you need to minimize your losses, and and the strategy here is is sort of this populist economics. Trump, you know, promised you a lot of stuff, but here we are with the COVID bill. Here we are with infrastructure. Here we are try- with tangible things to make your life better. How can you say to those folks, okay, and then we're going to give this freebie to you know somebody that went to Penn? Right. I, it just didn't. It was easy to demonize. It was an easy to demonize in addition to, I, I think, being bad policy. And so I, I was really encouraged that it, it showed that Biden has his eye on the ball, both on the side of he's not going to give in to everything on the progressive wish list. You notice the Green New Deal isn't on the isn't on the offing either uh, right now. And also, we, we he's gonna, he knows court, what the politics you know. are. Well, yeah. he, he, does, he does understand the politics, and this is something. And I, I've I've talked about this before, um, and, and it, it is interesting reading some of the punditry that that doesn't seem to actually connect with the way it plays in places like, say, in Wisconsin. I've told this story before, of of, of a guy that I know who's a who's kind of a political observer who was sitting at a 
political event in northern Wisconsin, I think it was the Wasar Stevens Point area here, um, listening to uh, a Democratic state senator at the time talk about, you know, her support for free college education. And he said it was at that moment that I realized that Republicans were going to win. Um, this was back in 2016. He says, because I'm looking at all of these guys, um, you know, these farmers, you know, people who work, um, you know, blue collar workers, and they're like looking at, you know, thinking what, so I, I get to pay for some other, you know, of some, some other kid to go and get a college degree. So you have two, you know, big constituencies out there. Um, number one, you know, what percentage of the electorate is, does not have a college degree? I mean, you know, put that aside. Over half. What, so. what percentage of folks have college degrees, but paid for it themselves or paid off their student loan? And now add that to that group. And then you have the group who go, yeah, we would like to have made the choice to run up big debt and have the taxpayers, you know, pay that off. You don't think there's going to be some legitimate resistance and resentment to that no yeah it's just a populist uh, uh, and you're just putting it on the t for the populist yeah, honestly, absolutely. To, do that, to do that and and so it's just it would be playing right into the republicans hands and that's not to say that obviously college costs are out of control the community college thing i think makes a lot of sense there are things that can be done um you know uh, uh, uh to 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 address this but 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 just as a matter of this blanket um you know, paying off student debts uh, uh, for everybody, no matter their income level, no matter their job, right? Um, no matter, you know, what their potential earning potential is going forward. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. There are also other things, right? Like for specific, in, you know, if you want to be a teacher, right? Like, I, you know, there, there are plenty of ways to to slice, you know, this it, to, to try to reduce some of the student debt burden on people and to try to reward people who go into public service and teaching and things like that. But, but, but a blanket, um, you know, is it, just, you know, letting, letting the, tr the Republicans play into this sort of phony Trumpian populism. And, and, and it just made no sense politically. And I was encouraged to see that Biden caught that. Yeah, that would, that would be deadly. Okay. So, uh, you got, I don't know whether you and I have spoken since, uh, Perry Bacon had that piece in the Washington post. Uh, I, don't think I, 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 I know that you had him on this podcast filling in for me, and I appreciate that. Um, but so Perry Bacon had a very interesting um, piece in the Washington Post where the headline was the misguided identity politics of the anti-Trump Republicans. I'm not sure that the headline is all that fair, but he's talking about, you know, the Liz Cheney's of the world, the people who'd signed on to this this declaration about the, the need for a new party and, and everything. Um and his point is that they seem to underestimate the degree of tribal identity. And then he says this, uh, Bush, Cheney, and Romney, people who are anti-Trumps, you know, Trumpers, might look to the model of Tim Miller, a 39-year-old who worked Ooh, on John McCain's. Let's, and, let's, can we cut that out, Jim? No. You know, no, the year, not, the age? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no. I think you're a spry 39-year-old. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. A 39-year-old... <laughs> Tim Miller, who will turn 40 shortly, <laughs> who, who worked on John McCain's and Jeb Bush's <laughs> presidential campaigns. After the 2020 election, Miller wrote an essay declaring he was leaving the Republican Party and for now, and for now backing Democratic candidates. Miller told me recently that he had long expected that some of the Republicans he knew would skip his wedding because Miller was marrying a man, not because he had opposed the Republican's presidential candidate. Oops. So ha have they? Did they skip their wedding? I did lose some. I lost some Trumpers at the wedding. Yeah, I lost some Trumpers at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. such is life. In his piece, Miller described how hard it was to leave. Be now, this is the key. Miller described how hard it was to leave behind his identity of Republican operative. I'm sure that other Trump skeptical Republicans feel similarly torn. I know that I'm asking them to do something hard. I suspect that being a Republican is as central to their identities as being black is to mine or being Muslim is to people who practice Islam, but your party affiliation is, actually isn't that hard to change. And it should, if the party itself changes, particularly if that party is pushing your country in a dangerous direction. And his suggestion was that basically, you know, people align with the Democrats. But I, I think there's two interesting things there is, is number one, that identity, it, it, that this is a good point. I mean, I, I, I agree with this, that it is hard to sort of let go of your family, your tribe, your identity, and years of your life. I mean, isn't that part of it, Tim? Is, is that at some point you go, I have devoted, you know, a decade or more, I don't know how long you did it, but I mean, of, of your professional life to this, 
can I walk away from that? Can I basically retrospectively say that maybe that was wasted time? That's hard for people to do. It is hard. Uh, and and I think that he also touches on this, just this idea that I, I don't I don't know that this was always true, right? But, the, but that uh, I think it's more true now that, that people are attaching, you know, their their political, they're making their political identity part of their identity in the, in the way they do with these other characteristic traits, right? You know, um, I, I think that, you know, he said it for blacks, uh, I think that like, as, as for Catholics, right? Like I grew up Catholic, I think that there's this sort of, you know, even people who sort of leave the church, there's still kind of this cat, like culturally Catholic identity. I think that's true for, for a lot of Jewish folks too. And, and, and I think people are now starting to attach their like red team, blue team to that identity. And that, that, that is in a lot of ways divorced from policy and, and is and that's really dangerous. And so um, I, I think that the point that he's making is, yes, it's hard and, and we should have a little bit of empathy to people who are trying to, to navigate through this. Um, well, at the same time, it's dual. It's it, 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 it is doable. And it's and, and I think it's logical to start to reassess these things. And I think if you look at somebody like George W. Bush, for example, obviously, he's not your average voter having been the president. But um you know, I, 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 of course, I think he probably agrees more on policy with Susan Collins than um, with Joe Biden. Uh, and so you'd understand why he would do a fundraising event for Susan Collins. Uh, I know that some people criticized him over that. But when you look at the presidential level with Donald Trump, and he disagrees with Donald Trump on immigration, which is what his most recent book is about, he disagrees with him on trade, he disagrees with him on foreign policy. So yeah, he disagrees with Joe Biden on things, but he disagrees with Trump on things. And so this idea that he he like takes this cop out and votes for writes in Condoleezza Rice, it's just like Perry's I think insight here is. Was that really a policy based thing? Was that really based on what was best for the country, or was or was that really you know letting these sort of identi- identitarian label this identitarian label of oh I'm on the red team overtake what was the prudent decision at the time to use his dad's word? Um, and, and I think that right now, given what we're seeing with one six. Given what we saw with Trump, the fact that that given what, the fact that he's leading the twenty twenty four polls by by a landslide, like the prudent decision is to oppose this party, and and if that means voting for Democrats for a while, that's that's what it means. So, I, I think that was a really good insight by him. I was happy that he referenced me, and um, and just for clarity's sake, on your question earlier, uh, because this is a nice thing. It's nice to mention nice things. Nobody, to my knowledge, skipped my wedding because it was a gay wedding, and so that was a positive change that I think that a lot of people had made over the you know 15 years or 12 years whatever it'd been since i'd come well, out no, no, uh, and, is, and so that that's is. good right i mean so that's but that's really kind of weird that then then that you'd have people that would that would not come over donald trump right no that you know i, I can i can understand that so i i have a slightly different take on this whole identitarian okay, thing because no one no, no I, I don't disagree but i mean my my personal experience was i i Obviously, I aligned with Republicans, but I never really thought of myself as a Republican. I, I'm, I'm not a team guy, so I, I thought of myself as a conservative. Um, so it was easier for me to say I'm not with the Republicans. I, you know, you, you've gone in this particular direction, and th- that team has gone crazy. So I'm not part of that team. But, but I do find the 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 lingering identity that I think of myself and I thought of myself for many decades as a conservative, and it's very very hard for me. Uh, to uh, and again, that I guess maybe that's that's that self identity. So I often find myself sort of thinking through an issue. There'll be something, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, um, you know, as, as I'm as I'm beginning to 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 address it, there's that voice in my head that says, "Well, you're a conservative. What should you think about this?" As opposed to, "What do you actually think about this?" Because you want to bring your thought into line with the identity in your head. Are you following me? It's not Republican, but but again, I also find that to be not helpful because right now, what does what do conservatives think about anything? I mean, they're all over the map. They make it up. I mean, you know, JD Vance is he now? Is he a conservative? Is she is Shannon? You know, Chanel Rion a, a conservative? What what does this actually mean anymore? As opposed to. That sort of liberating feeling of thinking, um, I'm, I'm just going to make up my mind on this particular issue, and I don't really care um, what, what it fits into, because the identity is going to be, this is what I think. But that's that's hard. And I, I mean, even I find, I find that hard, but I'm working on it. But let me put it this way. It's a work in progress, which is also why I don't want to identify as a Democrat or anything else, because I don't want another label. I don't want another identity. 
I just, I've, I've done that. I've been there. You know what I'm saying? I do. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd, Charlie. Um, <laughs> I hear you. I, 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 and I, and I, and I think that it is, I, I think that this is, uh, particularly challenging for people who are in politics, right? I, I think that there are, and I've heard about this with the Red Dogs, I think there are a lot of like regular folks, particularly kind of my generation and and down, who, who aren't as, weren't as attached to that Republican label, who sort of already made this move and, and they didn't really think about it and, and you know, wrench their hands about it as much as some of us do. But, but I think that for older folks, um, you know, who've been part of the party for a long, long time. You know, I was talking to just my uncle, for example, last weekend, and you know, it was not a political guy per se, but but just has been a Republican, pro life, you know, pro business, that sort of thing. And he's like, man, these guys have gone crazy, right? But I think it was hard then for him to wrap his head around. It's like, oh, okay, but now does that mean I've switched sides, right? So I, I do think for some folks, there is that they've sort of attached this identity to themselves, and it makes it harder to 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 you know sort of pull them pull them away from it and and I think that the Republicans have benefited from that because a lot of you know these working class white voters you know switched sides because of their you know cultural identities right that they they're like what the Democrats have done on trans issues or whatever it is you know for them ha- has made them feel uncomfortable with being a Democrat so they switch sides so that Republicans have these new natural members of their team who are really more aligned with this Trumpian JD Vance whatever you want to call it populist nation statism uh and, and while still maintaining some people you know who who are are, are stuck in their old identities and i think no, the democrats I mean, could do a better job trying to trying to attract those people frankly well, people need to understand how that mentality works so that you could have somebody with all of these doubts all of the disillusionment with the, with the party and then the conversation goes something like this well you're not going to vote for the other side you're not going to become the you know join the party of maxine waters right or something like that and those one signal those one individuals that that one anecdote stands for the party and and so i think i think the right has been more successful at that because it's not a series of beliefs or principles it's like you don't want to be aligned with fill in the blank and they will come up and they will nancy, always have san francisco nancy pelosi exactly exactly i mean that they've been using that since what 2000 and you know for forever. Nineties, nineties. I'm sorry. As soon as I started saying that, I'm thinking, no, this this goes this goes back into the nineties. Tim Miller, thank you so much for coming hey, on the podcast. Charlie, I just, yeah. I just have to promote my friend, uh, my friend Jeff Morton. If you've not had enough of my voice and you want to hear about NBA, I'm doing an NBA playoffs podcast on the Colorado Sports Guys. After this, Ooh. I'm taping it right after this. So Ooh. you just want to just dig into the NBA. I'm sure there are four people who've made it all the way to the end who just want more Tim Miller. So that's that that's what's happening. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Have and have a great weekend. And thank you all for listening to uh, this week's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday and we will do this all over again. All right.